All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to One Soccer. I'm your host today, Josh Deming, joined by my colleague, Alex Gongay ruzik And we are here today for a live stream because some news dropped. Um, although it's news, I guess we already kind of knew, Alex. But uh, the, the friendly that was rumored between Canada and France in Bordeaux on June 9th is officially happening, which means that in preparation for the Copa America for Canada, they will play the Netherlands, followed by France, two star-studded friendlies. Uh, and I just want to get your opinion quickly. Let me know, guys, in the chat what you think of the friendlies. I know that you're excited. I mean, I've been on X today. Um, I've had some DMs. It's exciting news, but uh, we're, we'll break both matches down. But just right off the bat, Alex, how do you feel that it's official and we will be play playing France, especially because uh, you, got some, you got some French in you? Yeah, I mean, Josh, did you clock that in about a two-week span, Canada is going to play the 2022 World Cup winners? and the 2022 World Cup finalists, and the 2018 World Cup winners. That's a pretty good month. And I mean, yeah, I, I think it's pretty pretty sweet to, to see France play Canada. I've always grown up watching a lot of France games. Like I remember 2006, Zidane, how dominant he was. And of course, the red card in the final. And I think the disaster of 2010. And then in, in 2014, they picked it up. And then in 2018, just how exciting of a team they were this past World Cup. Like it's going to be surreal to see guys like Mbappe, like right now, like one of the top players in the world running at that Canadian defense. You got such a stacked team across the board. I mean, we'll dive into it, but you got guys like Griezmann who are, who are still balling at a top level. He's been unreal this year for Atletico. You got up and comers like Kamavinga, Chumaini, Saliba, you know, Mike Magnon in goal. This is, this is going to be a fun game. One that, look, it's going to be a tough, tough test for Canada, but hey, if they're going to want to be serious about doing well at a World Cup in 2026 and heck this Copa America this year, this is the perfect level of opposition. I think France is what, ranked number two, as, as it said there. Uh, so this is, this is about as tough a test as comes. I think it's funny because not that long ago, Canada went, I mean, I know there was COVID in, in there as well, but even before that, we went well over a year without playing anyone outside of CONCACAF. And now all of a sudden, and even our preparation for the, uh, for the World Cup, I don't think was ideal it wasn't these type of matches so to get these two star-studded uh matches right before a copa america our first ever copa america uh it's it's really encouraging and especially because you know as a canadian fan it's, it's been a little frustrating basically ever since we qualified for the world cup i just remember feeling on on cloud nine and yes we disappointed in the group but pretty much everything after that has also been pretty disappointing so i, I don't know how this copa america is going to go but i feel better about the team playing a couple nations like this instead of whatever the alternative may have been, uh, it, it will give them just top quality world-class players, which you don't get to take on every day as, as Canadian fans have known. And uh, I'm I'm thrilled. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting. And I also think it's important that, uh, and we're going to get into that, Alex, that France and the Netherlands play two very different styles. Um, we, we've obviously seen that. It's going to be very interesting for me to see how BLO kind of matches up because throughout this Copa America, you know, Argentina, we obviously know that we're going to play, but even if we get to play potentially, you know, one of the other big hitters, uh, it'll be a different style, different, di like how your guy play compared to Argentina are drast drastically different. So it'll be kind of cool to see the way that he's able to try to adapt this team and what lineup he may go with. Uh, and just, again, just generally just being excited. So uh, let us know guys in the chat, what you guys have to say. Dimitri's here says, let's go. Let's get the party started. It's official. Um, the success story of France feeding the national team with the amount of immigrants is similar to that of the GTA feeding the Canadian national team. We should try to replicate France's success by tapping into Paris. Interesting take take there from Nathan. But yeah, it's uh, it's going to be fun. So the first thing we're going to do today on the stream is we're going to take a look at a starting 11, potentially. Uh, I think we should take a look at France first, Alex. So you got the, uh, the handy tool if you want to bring it up. I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and we will build a starting 11 for both sides. So uh, do you want to begin with uh, Canada? Yeah, I suppose so. I guess first off, if we're going to do this, um, we're going to have to settle on a formation, right? We couldn't We couldn't find, uh, do we go kind of the 3 4 two, one? That's what I put just for now, because that's the last formation Canada uses. Or do we think they're going to risk a back three against a team that has Mbappe, Dembele, Turam, Kolomwani? Do they maybe go for a back four? um i'm a little curious because last time we did this it was so funny because i i usually go one of two ways it's just kind of depending how i'm feeling on the live stream and i'll say all right alex you know put your blo hat on let's build that team just you know just to try to see what may happen 
Or I say, you know, let's put on our hat. Last time I said, let's put on the BLO hat. I can't remember exactly what it was for. If it was a starting 11 or just a roster. And the, the chat didn't like that. I said, Alex, Josh, put your own damn hat on. Build the team the way that you want to do it. So let's let's kind of do let's go that route today, Alex. This is going to be completely what we think BLO should do, just to try to balance out for last time. So, um, which is, again, it's, it's harder for me because I don't, like when I want to do things, I just, I see it. Like, it's like for example, a 4-3-3, and I think it looks beautiful, but I just know it'll never happen. However, um, I don't know. I'm torn, Alex. You're you're a little bit more critical with the uh, the starting 11. So you pick the starting 11, and then I can try to put the pieces together. So what do you what do you want? I mean, because what, what, what... what I'd say is, look, if, if, if we can't decide, the chat can also let us know if, if they want us to you know go for what canada might look like or do you want do you want us to 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 just you know to, to to go more our route i mean what we can also do is we can also build france first and kind of analyze what they might look like and pick how canada might counter that too because i think that's going to be important that all right how are you going to neutralize the fact that mbappe might be on that left half space and he's just so lethal there right like if you're canada you want to be very strong on the right side for example Let's do that. I'm a yeah. I'm a little bit more. I, I can I can do this. So France have been playing the four two three one, right? Which you already have that in play. I'm not sure why it says a. I'm not sure what system that says, but yeah, it's a four two three one, right? So, um, yeah. Magic Mike oh. can go. Uh, can go in net. I think that's probably pretty, pretty easy mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Well, basically, I have some stats here on France. They've used a four three three in fifty percent of their games over the last year. And then a 4 2 3 1 in 40% of their game. So essentially, it's always some sort of variation of the 4 3 3 or the 4 2 3 1. I mean, right now I can put in the like the locked in starters. Like, for example, you got Mbappe. That's, uh, you know, that one, that one you can also probably write in in, uh, in pen um, underneath them because uh, you know, he missed Grease. out on the last mid window, but got to put Griezmann in there. Um, where things get interesting, I guess, is kind of around them in midfield and, and at the back. Because uh, it feels like on paper, the best midfield is Kamavinga and Chouameni. They love to use Adrien Rabiot. I think DJ Deschamps just loves the athleticism he brings and like his ability to cover ground. He kind of has him in the Blaise Matuidi role. Um, also up front, they rotate between guys like Giroud, Colomwani, Taram. Yeah, I feel I, uh, at least from when I've watched him, I always feel like it's Rabio and Chuameni recently in the in the double pivot. But I mean, maybe like just what I've been seeing. So I, I that's kind of what I would go with, unless you think that Kamavinga would sneak in there. But um, yeah. that's just I, mean, I don't know. That's what I've seen. Really, he's been having a really good season for for Real. So I, I do wonder. Let's see what they they went with last game. Last game they played Chile, of course. They went for a four three three. Um, and in that 4-3-3, they went with the midfield of Kamavinga, Chuameni, and Fofana. So do we... And the one, and one think... against Germany, they had Chuameni and Rabio in there. But they didn't... I mean, they don't have Griezmann because he was, wasn't was available. So they played the 4-3-3, which is interesting. Well, well Zer, Zer Emery, who's a heck of a player, too. So someone he might... I'm sure might see the field uh, against, uh, against Canada. But let's... Uh... Well, that's a good question. Let's go Chumani and Rabio. Let's go for Deschamps. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have to put our DJ Deschamps hat on. And, you know, in France, he's known for being a bit more cautious. But, hey, he's won a World Cup and made a final. That's the funny thing with him. He can get away with benching a Camavinga because he gets results. So, funny how I, I, I would say um, the Hernandez brothers, maybe uh, left Teo on left back, Lucas center back, right? Is that And then Saliba, the other center back? I mean, Put Saliba for sure. Ubmakano should not be anywhere near that starting eleven. See Jonathan Put Klaus. Kunde at right back. Kunde, yeah, I like I like that. And then I would I know, say. I know he hates playing or what is he? He hates playing right back, but for this, sorry, dude. And then I guess we can put yeah, L Hernandez and then T Hernandez. I think we're getting good, somewhere here. Yeah, it's a good looking it's a good looking team so far. And then on the left. Uh, <laughs> Kingsley Coleman, we just saw it was going to be missing. I don't know. I, I would say Dembele is probably a better shout to start. Maybe Marcus Turam, maybe Diaby. I'd say probably Dembele on the right. And I'd then say maybe Dembele Turam. The... 
as a final two. I know Giroud, Giroud always ends up starting, but uh, it's interesting. He, well, he started, he started against Germany and then uh, against uh, Chile. He also started. So I guess, do we go Giroud to Ram? Maybe in that case? Yeah, they might try something a little, little experimental against uh, this Canadian side, just a touch without um, Ari Orgun and, and yeah, okay, I like that. All right. I know they're flexible with their attack, right? Like sometimes Turan plays on the wing, or whatnot. So yeah, that's pretty, pretty darn good looking squad there for France. And then you did go with the system that I believe that Biela will go with, which you know the three four kind of two one system. Um, if it was you, Alex, because we're, we're not putting our Biela hat on, if it was you, what system do you think best would? Oh, we gotta just before I ask you, I guess we gotta comment. 4 3 3, 4 5 1. Davies and Johnson as the fullbacks. Get Bombito in the starting 11, which I think he's done an excellent shout for so far with his start to the season with the Rapids. Um, Smith and Coline, um, I, unfortunately, I don't think are anywhere near the getting called in um, quite yet. So, especially Smith. Coline's having a, a decent season. I just think it's not a high enough level, but um, I don't mind the shout. Alex is a big fan of the 4 3 3. Do you think this Canadian well, side could do it? <laughs> Well, the, the way I'm thinking is we built France's lineup, right? So, like, what are the strengths? First off, there's a big strength that's Mbappe. Like, he's the he, he's for France. He just he's so dangerous down the left hand side. And now, I think we're starting to see a more mature version of Mbappe. Watching him the last year, where before he kind of always had to get involved, so he'd always be drifting to wherever the ball is. But now, I don't know if it's because he spent that two years with Messi in Paris. Um, or if it's just been something he's learned as he's gotten older he's a lot more comfortable and just like maybe there'll be 20 30 periods where he doesn't see the ball at all but he's touching that left wing stretching and then the ball comes to him one two touch opening up space for the other so i think mbappe is the big one M making sure you're solid down that right side um for for canada right around here i don't know if my mouse shows up on the screen when i do that um do you see it if I, if I move it like oh, this? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so yeah. Be solid here against Mbappe. Uh, sometimes he cuts inside too, which opens up the Hernandez overlap. So that's another reason to be wary of that left side. Another thing's the midfield, because this is a very good midfield. And then heck, if it's Kamavink, if it's Warren Zerhemri, if it's all these other guys, midfield's going to be important. So that's something I, I keep an eye on for Canada. Um, otherwise, the threats of Giroud, Taram, Usually how Deschamps loves to do it is like Giroud hold up player. So you need someone who can physically deal with that sort of hold up play, that crossing. But at the same time, he likes to play it off for Mbappe, for a Turam, for a Dembele, Coman, whoever it is. So you have to have a bit of speed. And then I guess um, other than that, that, those are probably the big threats to worry about. We're uh, dealing with someone like Ant Antoine Griezmann. He's got the ability to roam. Almost like a little bit like that, you know, Messi's got the ability to roam. That's very difficult to be able to try to, you know, plan around just because he, I mean, you, you see Griezmann doing a little bit of everything, especially even on the defensive side of the ball. He is the complete player, one of my favorite players to watch. Um, at least I think he's one of the biggest threats along with Mbappe on this side. So I'm I'm curious to... No, I agree with you. To try to, I think you know, based on this, I, I like the four five one show from Africans. I think something where it's like a four three three. yes, it's essentially a four five one, but it... You, you, you're not, you're, you know, you're, you're re reconnaissant, let's just say, of uh, the threat that can be provided in midfield. And you you play a true six to kind of match up with Griezmann. A little four, maybe like a four, 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 one, four, one. Is that kind of what it looks like right there? Or Yeah, yeah actually, like, you know, let's, yeah, call, let's four, call it a four, four, one, one, four, one. Okay. All right. I like that. Okay. Then let's build our team. Um, but quickly, so, Alex, uh, we, we, are, we are getting asked about the website because it is an impressive website. So uh, um, let... Uh, let our chat know because Alex showed me this yeah. website. I've never found it found it before, but it is pretty cool for anyone who likes building uh, starting 11s. Yeah, this one is called sharemytactics.com. You can see my mouse circling right there. Um, here they are. They have, you can donate to it. They, they've, they're proud to be used by many sites. Hey, maybe we'll have to ask them to get one soccer included on that uh, list of sites nah. that use it. It's, it's great because you can put your own team. You can put the opponent. Um, usually how I do it is like the way it's designed is you can like actually line it up on the side with the the players which we can do after we're just building the lineup right now for canada and, and for france but no it's it's a great website so shout out to to them for the great service bombito versus mbappe i i 
I'm excited to see what you have to say. Bombito versus Mbappe could be um, an interesting let's, one, and I want to see if you. I want to. Yeah, I guess I want to see if you get him in here because I know I, you've been you've been talking about Bombito for a long time, Alex. And to your credit, I have been a little skeptical about how quickly I thought he was going to get into a starting eleven in this Canadian side. He's done nothing but impress me so far this season with the Rapids. Um, so I'll let you gloat and in that ability and and give me a give me a shout give me a reason give me the number one reason why you think he deserves to start if indeed you do well i think if we're just going to dive into bombido it's the speed it's the speed of course you can argue about everything else the reality is the mls last weekend they put out a tweet because in, in bombido in one of the games he was tracked in at over 38 kilometers an hour i think it was it was around 22 yeah. miles he was rated as the fastest player in mls like so far this year, and because they track sprints, he's a center back who is six four. By the way, like this isn't some you know five uh, eleven guy you could jet or you know something like a six two winger. No, this is a six foot four center back who clocked in <laughs> higher speeds than what Alfonso Davies has put up this year. Of course, we know Davies yeah. put up faster in the past in different systems. This year, he hasn't asked to, to run as much under Tuchel. Just to give you an idea, Bombito has. You know, maybe not Davies-esque pace because no one does unless you're Mbappe, funnily enough. He's in that realm, though. So first of all, the speed is huge because how often, again, say someone like Steven Vittori, I'll use him as an example because I think he was all, he's always been a very great defender, but the big thing with Vittori was he didn't have the legs. So what did that mean when Canada played with him in the back three? It meant they naturally had to drop a little deeper just because if he played high, Vittoria, if he got caught out of position, it was game over. He'd eat a yellow, he'd get beat. Etc. What's nice with Bombito is you can take more risks. I know this is an interesting debate. Some people are like, oh, those speed he's using, it's a terrible example because it means he's always out of position. When you're a fast center back, that's the art of it. You can almost tempt forwards, but like, yeah, here, I'm playing a high line. I dare you to go run because you know that you can recover. It's like Davies at Bayern, right? Remember that year yeah. one where he had all those recovery runs of, oh, yeah, let's just let the striker go ahead of me. Oh, yeah, just kidding. You thought you had me. You're funny. Um, of course, against Mbappe, you can't get away with that sort of stuff, but it is nice to know that, say, Mbappe gets past the right winger, gets past the right back. Oh, you have a center back who can at least keep stride to stride with a guy like Mbappe. And that's just the speed because Bombito, he's he's growing a lot in the air. He's very good on the ball. He's, he's a ball playing center back. He has all the attributes of a modern center. Yeah, Herman noticed his uh, ball playing ability very quickly, which is why at the Gold Cup, he put him in the midfield, which really rubbed me the wrong way. I just didn't think that was a natural fit for him. I thought in the way that Herman was playing, the outside right center back would be ideal for him. I still think in a back three, that's where he could play, but he's playing in a back four right now for the Rapids. And like everything Alex just said, he's a very different profile from the center backs we have and, a, and has freakishly crazy speed. And against a, a front four or whatever this may be, and you don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we know Mbappe is going to be on the pitch. I like it. Um, so I, I, I'd feel comfortable. I'm assuming you want to put him in at the right center back, right? Let's just put him in. That's what he's playing for club. So uh, yeah. it's at least comfortable. I guess that leads to the next question before we build the rest of our four. Who's the goalie? Sorry. Is it Max oh, Kreppel this... we're assuming here? Yeah, yeah. I just don't think there's much. Sure. Yeah, I don't think there's much debate. Unless you, like, you know, unless you've seen something from Dane that I haven't. I think that, you know, I do like Dane St. Clair. I, I do like some of our other options. I just think it's not much of a debate. Kreppel is the guy to go forward. And I'm very comfortable with that. It works with me. And look, I mean, Kreppel, unfortunately, got... Had a bit of bad luck this weekend. A bit of a questionable red card in Portland versus LAFC as Denny Buanga continues to <laughs> annoy MLS fan bases with some of his, uh, his his antics, I guess you could call it. But no, Kripo's, uh, you, you know you know what you're going to get. He, he did well last game, so may as well earn a big match. Exactly. And he's good with the ball at his feet, which I love. But we got a question here, Alex, and I guess we can move to the fullback positions is... Uh, a fullback question. Who are your fullbacks three, four, assuming that Richie and Sam aren't ready for the Copa America? I, I don't I think I don't think there's any risk that Sam's not gonna be, is there? I, I think uh, Richie's a massive risk, and I think I'd say we'd we would do this starting eleven definitely without him. Um he's saying Davies and Alistair as, as one, two, and I I would say probably yeah. Uh but yeah, sorry, Alex, is is there any risk that Sam may not be fit? I think Sam should be there. I at a could yeah. be the Whitecaps are managing him so well. He's like yet to play more than 45 minutes in a game. They're getting him up to full speed. So well, I think I think um, Kubi should be there. It's interesting for the right back, though, because if Larea isn't ready, that's a great question from Africans because 
I think right away, like, oh, maybe a Farsi, but clearly he hasn't showed the interest at the moment. He's very much leaning, like, let me represent Algeria. I just, fair, I guess it, I say option. Alex, I sorry for cut, cutting off. I did, I did want to go there with you, uh, just because I, I just put out a report on it, and I, I don't know. I was, I was looking to see because there was a lot of um, rumors out there that he not, might not be eligible for the switch, considering that he played for Canada's U23s in the Olympic qualifiers. And there's been some issues and some other dual Nats looking to get the switch over. So I was just doing a little bit of digging and asking around to see if, you know, if there was any issues there and if basically Farsi was open to represent Canada. And what I was told was basically that there's no issue whatsoever um, with his goal right now. And he's entirely focused on representing Algeria and, and that it doesn't look like he will change his mind. So it was as clear cut as an answer I got, which is super unfortunate because I've really enjoyed watching Farsi so far this season. I still cover him. I know you still do too, Alex. Uh, so it it was unfortunate, but I res I mean it's never easy being a dual nat, and I you know I respect Farsi's decision, but that pretty much pretty much rules him out. And I think I would have had him as probably my as one of my three four. I would have probably had Sam, and because assuming Richie's not there, I would have had Farsi. So I'll throw it back to you after interrupting you there. Sorry, Alex. Um, but I just wanted to get that out there. So if if he's not an option um i'm trying to well, think of who would be it, that's why it's interesting because you mentioned um like uh the right back options farsi right away for for whatever reason right back depth is it, you know after after richie and uh, or yeah that's it after alistair johnson and richie larea that's very good depth but after that if you do get an injury to a, a johnston or a larea it is interesting i just i've opened up the preliminary squad just to see if there's any names that um you know it's kind of that we're maybe not thinking of like as a natural right back because again immediately the only one that comes to mind is a ryan raposo for example um which could also be very much in this consideration the only thing is he's a lot more of an attack minded profile right someone who's uh, who brings a, a bit more of the offensive side of the game Playing as a true wing back out in Vancouver. Raposo, of course, made the preliminary squad. But yeah, legitimately other I guess Dominic Zator. Dominic Zator is probably, I'd say, one of the next man up. Other than that, there isn't an, a, a whole lot of true natural uh, right back options, I guess. It and it doesn't mean that we have to bring like two two right backs. We've seen it before where like if um like we, we've seen it where Davies is isn't considered a left back in Herman's eyes, but we'd only bring Atakubi, because like Davies has never played as a natural left back, and the only other left back we brought was Atakubi. Now they can play. So if you, I mean, if you look at this, I mean, Tejon has played right back before. You know what I mean? Like he could be considered mm -hmm. the other option. You could bring Johnston and then just have Tejon if you know. And also like there, there, there's there's makeshifts like a like a Bombito could get pushed out. I mean, we know his speed. Ahmed could play there as well. Uh, Ali Ahmed and I, I remember saying that last time, and I got a couple comments saying like I because I, I don't have any issues not bringing a natural one. Schwanier yeah, can play there. Exactly. Sorry, just so, another name. No, no. I agree, but I, in the last time we did this, I put Ali Ahmed as my like my backup right back, and in the comments we're like, Josh, why didn't you go with like a more natural option? And I'm like, well, there's not really one, and more than likely there'll be just a makeshift if uh, if Buchanan is not ready to go or Johnson isn't ready to go, depending on what system we play. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I just don't know. I don't know what my answer would be. I would probably just go with one of the makeshift options at the moment over like a, a Dom's tour, just because. I, I would just trust that Tejon can maybe slot in if he needed to, or Johnston we have there, and maybe push Bombito out. And I would like to see Ali Ahmed in there. So I think between all those options, we're good, and I probably wouldn't put Zator on, on my roster. I know we're not talking about a roster, but anyways, we'll be you, Alex. Well, well, that's it. I mean, and plus we have to consider that at least what's nice with Johnston is as long as he's fit, this dude racks up 90s for fun. Like, he, you know, mm -hmm. if, if there was Air Miles for, for playing 90 minutes, he'd be, be loaded. Like, when he's healthy, remember at the World Cup, there'd be, like, three games, or not World Cup, but, like, World Cup qualifying, sorry, when it was the three-game windows, it would be, like, Johnston, 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 90, 90, 90, and, like, every, literally everyone else would rotate except Johnston who's stack it. Those were the two guys, and Borean, of course, in goal. Even Vittoria would have to rotate, but Johnston, nope, 90, 90, 90. So at least... You're a bit more comfortable than of that say versus another position where you might not sure you're getting a ninety or whatnot. So that's just I, hundred, else to I agree, and I, we had a couple of comments saying Luke Defus role can play there as well. Um, he can, I know he can. Just he hasn't had a, a he hasn't really had a start yet for Canada. So I, 
I don't know if he's like the go-to option. Like I said, probably like a Tejan Kalyamed type player will go there, but he can. Again, he's a makeshift option, which is probably why we'd go with one of them. So, so yeah, I guess to round out our back four there, Alex, uh, Johnson Davies, we're going to stick him at left back. Is that the, is that the play here? Uh, yeah. Or do you want I to mean, say, or you want Sam in? I think mean, it's, it's a good argument for, um, for, for Sam, but I think it's something like we've said for a while, it feels like Davies left back just seems to be the, progression that makes sense but that we haven't really you know seen yet i think for example a davies up against a turan davies against an mbappe that's the sort of matchup you you his want matchup, i mean his, his matchup against saka hmm? didn't throw you off there a little bit <laughs> i mean davies, hey look it was davies a, had a tough night that's it it was it, it was a tough night but it's funny because with davies it feels like the guy the wingers who have given him the most trouble over the last five years if i'm going to say off the top of my head are three it's it's uh saka it was bernardo silva and it was angel di maria it's those like not as they're not, none, none of those three guys are like pace guys those are all three technically gifted low center of gravity love to like use their hips love to like cut inside be cheeky those are kind of the ones that give a davies trouble because Funnily enough, he's had great success. Like, remember 2020 when he, or 2019, too, when he played Sancho with Dortmund? And no problem. Like, any guys who were trying to beat him with speed down the, the right, like no problem. Against Chelsea, there was a winger back. I forget who it was in that 2020 um, series where he had a pretty good uh, pretty good go. So, funnily enough, I'd back him against, like, a Dembele or Taram versus, like, some of those. I, I agree, and I think the point is that we have our hats on, not Biello's, um, and we all want to see Davies at left back. Maybe gives an opportunity for someone like a Jacob Schaffelberg, who I think has done more than enough to maybe deserve a start. We also have a Liam Miller, which which we'll get to, but yeah, let's put Davies at left back. I'm happy with that, and then uh, I, I'm curious to see where you're going to go with this, Alex, because be, because we went with Bombito as our one of our center backs in a back four. It leaves Cornelius or Kamal Miller. I think... I, I, again, if I'm at yellow hats on, I feel like it's going to be Kamal Miller, but I personally would go with Cornelius. Uh, I think that would be a brand new look, Bombito Cornelius in, in a back four. Uh, but I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I honestly, I, I would assume Biello would go with Miller. I just, that's what my gut tells me. But this is, uh, this is us, Alex. So do you agree or do you want to see something else? I, I think it's, it's, it's split down the middle. It really depends what we want because that's, what I've come to notice with the, the Miller versus Cornelius, of course, Miller's kind of been preferred now for Canada, but you kind of get different skills with both. With Miller, you're getting good ball playing ability. That's kind of always been his strength. He's someone who, who likes to make a big slide tackle. He's someone that, you know, that that's kind of his thing. Conversely, with the Cornelius, you're getting decent ball playing ability. That still pretty good. It's just Miller that's probably the one of the elite parts of his game at least one of the top parts of his game and then Cornelius he's good in the air he's someone who can be a, a bit of a rock in the middle so I think it depends what what more do you want like on that left side to a Davies likely to run for do you want more of a Miller behind him or do you want more of a Cornelius um, that's kind of where where I'd see especially you do have Bombito back there but and you can provide some cover for Johnson so I'd, I'd say you could generally make a good argument for, for Miller or Cornelius so I think it would depend on what more of a I'll let you pick Alex slot one in your 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 control right now of the starting eleven. The pressure's on you. Um, it looks like the chat is leaning a little bit towards Cornelius, but like I said, I think the other will go with with Miller. Well, let's, um, let's ride with the chat and look. I think it's something where if you're assuming Bombito can bring a bit more of the speed, then he can also you know he, he can he, he can end up being that cover. Um, and you have Cornelius in there, but look, I'd say you could go really either way based on what you need. Maybe because again with Miller, you might not see the ball as much against France, so you don't need Miller's ball progression. You just need, you know, guys like Cornelius and Bombito are good in the air to deal with Giroud, for example. So no, I think it's a fair, fair choice. Absolutely. And if you guys are just joining us right now in the chat, be sure to drop a like, uh, say hello. We have uh, obviously here because the France friendly was announced today, and Alex and I are building our kind of predicted starting eleven of what we would like to see. So if you have any opinions, put it in the chat. We're gonna we're gonna try to roll through this a little little bit quicker, and we're gonna get on to what we would just change slightly for the Netherlands. But we're moving on to the midfield right now, Alex. Uh, then then we'll go out wide. So for the three man midfield, I mean, I think we can slot in Eustachio. I'm assuming. Do you? Tr you I'm assuming we have to put him as the six. I don't know if I would trust anybody else in this pool right now to take on that responsibility. Uh, even though, like, I know we, we could argue um, Eustachio is, well, is great as an eight, but. Uh, 
Or, you got an opinion? You think Piet? You, you, would you like that? I mean, Kone is a lock as well. Uh, but well, I was. Yeah, all, we can we can look. Basically, all I'm saying is every time I watch Montreal, I continue to be blown away with how quietly good of a season Samuel Piet seems to be having in the middle. Like again, this weekend watched him against Cincinnati, and he was a rock. You know, Lucho Acosta. All the threats Pupenza that Cincinnati has, no problem for Pietti. He's just so solid. And I wonder, again, with his form, with the other the other choices. Like, of course, you got an Ahmed. You got a Schwanier. Both great choices. But if you want to free up Ustakio and Kone, it quietly continues to seem that Piet is the, the guy. And, you know, if we're assuming that you're going up against France with Griezmann, Chouamani, Rabiot, right? It might make, make a little sense to go a bit more conservative and do like a Piet Ustakio with Kone being a bit more of the, the free role player. I I agree. Like I last time when uh, the roster dropped, we were talking about him. We saw Piet on the roster and a lot of the chat didn't, didn't like that. We, we both argued. I mean, his form deserves it. it. Yeah, it's just kind of what style you want to see. Um, I am t- a little torn because I, I get what you're saying. Eustachio also isn't in the greatest form because he's just simply not playing right now at Porto. I don't usually think that matters when it comes to the national team. I think, you know, we know what we're going to get out of Eustachio. Uh, for me personally, though, like I just like the look of a Eustachio, Kone, and Ahmed, or even a Schwanier. I just, you know, to me, it looks better. It doesn't mean that it's going to work against his France side. Uh, but I'm, I'm not overly convinced that even putting a Piet in there with a Kone and Eustachio w- w- would work as well. So I'm really well, torn. I would probably go Ahmed. Just I'd rather see that. We, it, it may not work, but it's a it's a middle three that I, I could get behind going forward. Um, well, all I'm but saying But I get is your point. I get your point. If you want... What we could a bit of an alternative. Ali Ahmed has been very good for what, in his new in a bit of a different role, not a new role because he's 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 going to play midfield as well for the Whitecaps. But at the moment, he's been playing left wing ish, and he has been causing a lot of problems for um for for MLS defenses and whatnot. There's also a scenario where you have like a Piet Cone, uh, Piet Ustakio Kone, and you have Ahmed in this like left free role because you know Davies is going to overlap, so Ahmed can kind of cut inside and help the midfield too. Of course, it's tough because you got like a Liam Miller too, who 100% deserves to to be in consideration for a start. You have Jacob Schaffelberg, for example, which hey, you know it might be a big stretch to say go start against France, but he continues to to perform in limited minutes for Canada. You have options at that left mid, but for example. An Ahmed could be nice because it, it gives you a bit of versatility of, oh, he can cut in and make it a midfield, but he also has the speed and skill to go 1v1 um, and, and be be annoying down that side. Hey, if we're going for the result against a stacked team like this France side, I'd have no problem going Piet in the six, Eustachio Kone, getting someone like Ahmed in there, probably put Buchanan on the right, and then David up front. We'd have to sacrifice Laren. I think that's, well, that's I think I think, that has to be it. Well, that's it. That striker one, I think, again, it's with David and Laren. They can. They have moments together. The, the reality is, you just don't get enough out of two of them combined versus what you lose in midfield against top teams. Where yes, you're playing a team that won't play in, as much in midfield. You can get away with Laren David, 100. I think a Laren off the bench is a nice super sub. So honestly, I'd probably, if I were gonna, if I were gonna build, I would go for, um, I, I would round it off with what you said. Um, so then I would just swap, uh, Ustachio. Like that, and boom, four one four one. Bit of a flexible, something different, but it's a different look. I like it. Uh, I would love to see how we would compete against a team like France. I, I there's a lot to like. I, I do, I do like it. And I think that uh, out of the options, it could give them, you know, a good opportunity to to see what they have and to see if they can compete at this level. So, Alex, we're not going to do this next uh, section very, um, very long. So we're going to move on. Um, to the we're going to maybe take a look at the roster i just want to ask you very quickly if this was i'm not going to build it or anything but if we're against the netherlands is there anything that you'd any or any player you'd maybe like to get see get a start um that you think would match up well against the netherlands that's not in the starting 11 or could you see that a very similar starting 11 that we just built um competing against the netherlands as well yeah, I mean, uh, it'll be interesting because the Netherlands offers a bit more of a different threat. Because I'm looking at their team lately. They've been playing over the last year. 3-4-3 three, three is their main formation. I think that's been the case ever since. I always get loose track with the Netherlands managers because they've been in like ro- rotating so much. At the moment, it is Komen, right? Because he ended up going back after the Boer's weird stint. So it is Komen. And since Komen's come in, he's been using more of a 3-4-3. Three, 
Uh, he did also experiment with the 4-3-3. Um, but, you know, so you, you'd expect some variation of uh, of that formation. They're not as heavy in midfield, it seems, that as they are in France. So, for example, you don't have to worry, I'd say, as much with, like, a, throwing in a, a Piet like we did in this France one. Because, you know, Netherlands, for example, in their 4-3-3, they put Veerman, Rangers, and Wijnaldum. And Wijnaldum, of course, playing in Saudi right now. Like, it's not... The, the most dangerous but then up front they got so many options they got Xavi Simmons Memphis Depay Cody Gakpo um there's a few other ones that are uh, that are in pretty good form that I'm not even mentioning here uh, let me just grab one of the names they have Daniel Malin at Dortmund I like his profile very quick he can cause all sorts of problems they, they have options up front so I think worrying about those options up front but also knowing they play a 3-4-3 maybe a bit more speed down the flanks could be an area to, to target against them all right, I like it. We're going to move on to uh, Canada um, and their manager talk. I'm just going to go through a couple comments here. We have uh, Mr. Kane saying that Schwanier, and I have no problem getting him into one of these uh, sides as well. We had Vincent saying that we always say this about our players, them moving to Europe, but it hasn't been happening. Seeing it with Bombito too, have seen nothing to indicate Europe even um, – Ahmed and or even know who Ahmed and Bombito are um so there's that I can say confidently Vincent though that there are European clubs that are definitely aware of Ali Ahmed uh as for Bombito he I mean he could just came onto the scene man this like this season right now that just began in MLS could be kind of his his breakout campaign and I mean those stats that you see I guarantee clubs in Europe have seen the, the pace that this guy has and maybe taking a little bit more of an eye to see how he progresses this season I wouldn't be worried about Canadians going over to Europe because I think that we're in a really healthy time right now. We're seeing plenty of Canadians making the trek over to Europe. They don't always work out. You know, we've, we've seen the Richie Larea's go there and have to come back, but we've seen a lot of success stories. I mean, just look at Tejan Buchanan, a little bit of an unorthodox route to the highest level, but you can all arguably put Bombito maybe in that, like potentially for a future in that, in that discussion, he didn't have the mo most straightforward kind of route to major league soccer. And, if he keeps doing what he's doing right now, I think there's a good opportunity that he could end up in Europe. And I'm I'm pretty confident. I don't know if Alex wants to say anything more about that, but I'm pretty confident we'll see Ali Ahmed in Europe at some point. Yeah, I think it's something where the profile, it, it, it's trending that way, right? I think it, it you know, it's, it's something where they just going to keep getting reps and games like this help. Because, for example, we forget it. It's something simple. But like Tejan Buchanan balling out for Canada against Belgium, against... Uh, Croatia was a good way of him getting these transfers. If you're getting Bombito on the pitch against a France, Ali Ahmed against the pitch against France, that's only going to accelerate it. And team, teams are aware of the Canadian market because they're going to start to realize that because they love the American market. It's been a pretty good one. They've gotten some good players out of MLS over the years. The American market's starting to inflate. That's what happens whenever you start to do a good thing, right? It was like before that everyone used to raid Uruguay, Ecuador, all these countries now they're starting to raise their value it's like oh yeah you want our players well you're gonna have to pay for them it feels like canada is kind of one of those where teams are gonna realize like oh they got these watford went to to montreal and got a kone for like five million that, that could end up being a really good deal they went up and got, uh, celtic got johnston for five million like okay that was some smart piece of business let's go get this ali ahmed for a four or five million uh, let's go get a bombito for two three million center backs will always naturally be a lot lower um, so I think it's something where they just have to keep performing and um, we'll, we'll see what happens from, from there. Cause it, there's, there's been enough examples of guys like Buchanan and Johnston and Kone all making that jump off the back of strong seasons. Yeah. It's not like, all right. Like some of the, like some of those big American transfers you've seen, but it, it's growing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I, I don't see any indication that's going to slow down. Uh, there's a lot of success stories. I personally think Bombito and Ahmed are going to be two of those as well. And I'm curious to see what league they potentially hopefully one day go to. And I hope they have finish off their season right now in MLS because both are having a very strong start. So Alex, we are moving on now. The next talking point for you guys in the chat and let me know is we're going to go over to the manager talk and we're, we will probably do this for a lot of live streams, probably about when we talk about the national team, just because it's, it's a big talking point. Uh, I would say if you're looking to bring in just to start off, if you're looking to bring in a big, international manager i think having copa america and the world cup that we are co-hosting is two massive pieces obviously but now on top of that we have two friendlies lined up against top tier opposition as well so it just makes the pitch to me so much easier to, if a manager you're looking at and being like all right listen you come into this young group 
golden generation of Canadian talent. We're going to give you proper preparation for a Copa America. It's our first Copa America. You have the Netherlands and France to really take a look at what this team is made of, to see what works, go into a Copa America where guess what? You get to play Messi. And yet, even though you're playing Messi, it is a group that out of all the options is probably the best chance you have of getting out. And then from there on, you know, build what you can do. You can have a couple of con CONCACAF competitions and then we're co-host a World Cup. It is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty appealing job for, I think, a good chunk of managers out there. I just don't know exactly where you want to begin today, Alex, because, you know, we've heard um, the Frank Lampard rumors. Those have been squashed. But now we've heard new names, old names, but new names in, in Tommy uh, Whelan Jr. and Bobby Schmidiotis. So, Alex, I'll throw it over to you. Um, first, tell me a little bit, if you, if, you know, if you agree of how maybe appealing this job truly is. And um, do you think Bobby and Tommy have actually have a shot? That's a good question. Um, I think in terms of the appeal, there's no doubt there's appeal because, again, in a, in a world of ma managerial times where there's so much instability, no one's guaranteed to make the World Cup, right? Like, I bet you in 2006, you would have been like, oh, an Italy job, for example, is guaranteed World Cup and they go out and miss like two, two in a row, right? Or whatever it is, their streak now. Like that's there's so much instability. There is aren't many jobs where you're looking like, oh, this team is a guaranteed Copa America. This team is a guaranteed World Cup. They have some pretty darn good friendlies before that Copa America. If this trend continues, I imagine Kevin Blue can get them some darn good friendlies before the World Cup as well. They of course got Concacaf, a Gold Cup next year, Nations League chances to win a trophy. Really mold this group together. I, I you'd have to imagine it's desirable, and I think there's a lot of managers would know the value of you know a job like this uh just knowing that okay especially for say a younger manager or a manager looking to try to kind of throw their name back out there you do a job with this canadian team people like will will be like a respect of almost like oh you went and took a shot on a canadian team that isn't as well known you took them to a great place all right like hat tip you that that can really help your career you've kind of seen that with you know past you know, past teams in sim similar scenarios. So I think it's going to be very attractive. As for the candidates, look, I think Tommy Wilden Jr. and Bobby Smirotis, I like the profiles. I, I really like the profiles. And I think because of that, there's no reason why you can't consider it. Because I think with managers, I just struggle to really throw my hat behind the idea that you need experience. Because Sam Allardyce's experience. Tony Pulis is experienced. Are those two guys you want coaching the, the men's national team? I, I'd probably say no, just <laughs> based on their, their their direct styles and their their you know how much they love the English game. I think you want profiles, and I think it's funny that you're sitting having this discussion. You get so much so caught up on experience when someone like John Herdman came in. There was questions of oh, never coached in the men's game before, etc. He had a good profile. It was a profile that this team needed. He brought this team to great heights. He moved on. Perfect. I think the profile should be what's considered. And of course, if there's a profile that comes along that ticks all the boxes and his experience and his top pedigree, you go for that person. But I think at the very minimum, profiles are what matters. Well, for Nazi, one of the top coaches in MLS, he's only been a head coach for three years. No one was talking about him as experience when he was, he was first hired at Montreal. Turns out he had a perfect profile. He ended up being a pretty darn good coach. So I like the profiles and I think it's something where in those scenarios, I'd rather get more caught up on what we know these managers can do versus uh, their, their their CV. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to coaching, that stuff matters, of course, knowing how to manage a locker room and whatnot. But it isn't as important of how they coach. What are their tactics? How do they manage locker rooms, et cetera? And I think Smyrna Otis and Wilden Jr. have proven with Calvary and, and Forge to Brit. They're building winning environments and they play nice football. So let us know, guys, right now in the chat. I'm going to ask you guys two questions so you can answer both or one. The first question is, do you think we need a new manager before the Copa America? Or maybe it doesn't bother you. So if you think that we need a new manager before the Copa America, say yes in the chat. And if you don't, say no. The second question I'm going to ask you is, you know, throw some options and Alex and I can discuss them. Who do you think is the best fit to take on this project? And where I'm going to go next is a couple of big names. I mean, we know we've been linked with... Uh, Thierry Henry, we have already mentioned right there. Renard, um, there's some, I think there's somebody else. Yeah, Thomas Christensen. Uh, these guys all have jobs. And that's the interesting thing right now is because I, what I think makes this project so appealing is I do think the Cold America is such a big deal. I went out so many times and saying it would be devastating for this program if we didn't qualify. 
uh, you know, by the skin of our teeth, we were able to, but not only is it an unbelievable competition with so much history and now we get to be a part of it for the very first time, but it's a big piece of the puzzle that we could use to hopefully bring in a proper manager. Now, some of the options are good. I do like a lot of these options, just they have priorities coming up this summer. Um, both France, um, Olympic managers have the Olympics and they're co-hosting it. So obviously they're not going to leave it. And you have Thomas Christensen, who I think could be a good option as well, but he's got Panama going to the Copa America as well. So that rules out a lot of pretty good candidates. Now, you know, if it doesn't bother you and you want to stick with Biello and see how the Copa America goes and then target one of those guys, I get that. But if not, Alex, I want to talk about just a couple of candidates right now, just for fun. I mean, we already talked a little bit about Bobby and, and Tommy. Um, but I want to focus a little bit on two kind of outside shots. One, I find very appealing, Jesse Marsh. Although I don't think, and this is where I want to get your thoughts. I think Jesse Marsh would be so much fun because right now he's poking the bear uh, with the, the U.S. Federation. He's very active on social media. Uh, he's just a funny character. I think he's a good coach as well. I just think that his style would be very difficult to transition over to the national team. And I just don't know if he's got enough time and enough goodwill within like you know canada you know he's got some experience in canada to be able to give him the reins and try to implement it because if it doesn't work then you're kind of back to where you started the other one's graham potter i've seen that name thrown around quite a bit and it's an intriguing one to me because i think he did really good work with brighton i think he got an unfair hand at chelsea and he's kind of been waiting for that next move i think he was linked to the sweden international job so well, maybe there's um, some interest there but he, go ahead. he was linked to ajax and apparently he said no to ajax it was I mean that that there's a lot going on with that club right now. So I well, mean, that's it. It's if, fair enough, uh, but just just throwing out that he rejected a club of Ajax's profile. Maybe it was to keep the door open for Canada. For keep, I can say, well, or if he's got some issues with uh, off the field things, maybe Canada's not the greatest fit for him as well. But we we could talk about him regardless. Um, but like I said, there was some links to Sweden too. So maybe you know maybe he's going to put his foot in that international job. So Alex, I'm going to let you think for a minute here. I'm going to go through a couple. Um, um, of the chats and just let me know which one of those two Jesse Marsh or Graham Potter you would rather see Canada target and for what reason I just told you kind of a little bit about my piece and my worries with Marsh even though I think it'd be fun and Graham Potter I just think he is a, is a quality manager he's waiting for a next opportunity this this could be a good option um you don't need to know this about Alex and I but you know we would we'd go to battle for Wilfred Nancy any any day of the week I just don't think unfortunately that's going to be an option but I asked the question do we need a new manager before uh, the Copa America, and we got a yes, 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 absolutely yes, yes, yes. I don't think I've seen anyone say no. Um, yes, we need a high caliber coach, not Biello, Wielden, or Smirnionis. Pretty good praise there for a couple of CPL's best. Uh, got a couple of people saying Bobby impressed me. Um, yes, we need a new one for Copa America, definitely for the World Cup. Um, yeah, English managers are good defensively, probably a good choice. Wow, rejected Ajax, and now I'm going to throw it over to Alex. So are those two options, Alex? Everyone apparently thinks that we need a manager before the Copa America. I just ruled out a bunch of quality managers that have jobs. I gave you two that are without a contract. Um, which one do you like the look of? I'd probably pick Potter of the you two. Um, I think his profile, again, when I'm looking at profile, what does this national team need? It feels like the big consensus, uh, and based on what we've seen, it just feels like they need a bit of a rethink tactically. Um, like, I think a lot of, I think it's important to center the fact that a lot of what Canada did under John Herdman was good tactically. I think that kind of gets lost in the shuffle because of a couple World Cup games, because of 20, uh, 2023 that was obviously tough on and off the pitch for the team. I, th I still think John Herdman over his five years did a lot of good things tactically, but it feels like right now with the current setups, we've seen like the three, four, two ones and the striker heavy formations and Alistair Johnson playing right CB kind of hit a wall with a lot of the tactics that worked so well before. So I'd love to see some sort of tactical rethink. So I think that's the big thing I'm focused on. And then of course, secondary is, uh, but also like how do these managers manage rooms has, so that's where something like I love a Marsh because you saw it at Leeds, you saw it at Salzburg. Uh, he's he's a very good like man manager. Like some of the videos, like the fact that in like Salzburg he was there for like three months and he already learned German just so he could communicate with his players. Like I love little things like that. Like a manager that clearly wants to give the best environment to his players, but then also with Graham Potter, 
he's he struggled at Chelsea with just so much going on. Could he manage a room like like Canada's? I think there's less going on in Canada than Chelsea, where they have like <laughs> 45 million good players and you know not not enough minutes for all of them. Like any manager would struggle with that job, so I'll discount that. But I'll go Potter just because I love the way his teams played tactically. Uh, you know they love. Can play in a three, can play in a four. He loves to build up. He loves to play fluid soccer. Um, I think that could be fun. And then what I what I like about him, he's got an interesting background because English coaches, the knock against him is they never leave England. They just stay in England. They always want to get an English job. Graham Potter went and spent time in Sweden and learned from different environments. He also left. Uh, he went to another uh, country, if I'm not mistaken. He's someone who seems like a student of the game beyond just like the English umbrella. And I think he would adapt and learn nicely to a, a Canadian environment. So that's what I like about a, a, a Graham Potter. And I think that's the sort of thing that Canada should be looking at. Someone who can bring a bit of a strong tactical perspective, someone who can bring a bit of an interesting personality and hopefully someone that can can manage, uh, you know, a locker room and keep everything in line. Because I think that's when this Canadian team is at its best is when the vibes are good. And we kind of saw that last week with the Trinidad uh, camp uh, last month, pardon me. Versus in November, where the vibes didn't feel as good and it kind of showed on the on the field. So any manager that can tick those boxes, I think Potter seems you know upbeat guys. His his, his Brighton team was fun. It, I, I can support that. That's what I like about Potter. Is why I, I brought him up personally, just because you don't see a lot of English managers leave the English game. And I remember when Potter was at Sweden and just you know just through following the Premier League, there was a lot of. Um, like pundits being like, oh, like look at this guy. You know, he he went out of his comfort zone. He went to Sweden. It's not the you know the most competitive league, especially compared to where he ended up in the Premier League. Um, but he did it, and he did it really well. And he did it so much so that, like I mentioned, uh, that the Sweden national team, because he was in Sweden and, and you know coaching over there and did really well, that the Sweden national team wanted him to maybe come on board. And, and he's familiar with some of their players and the way that their league is. So he's not afraid to step outside his comfort zone. So I mean, if you know he's got any ambition of. You know, maybe coaching at a World Cup or a Copa America. Like, I don't know. Like, we haven't seen him. We've seen him links to some pretty big clubs, like you just mentioned. But we haven't. I haven't seen anything like really concrete where he, they went out and said like what exactly he's looking for. You know, is it another Premier League gig? Is is it a national team gig? I don't really know. But the fact that he's still a free agent, I think it could be a, a pretty intriguing fit, and I wouldn't mind it at all. Uh, but we're gonna end. So those are the two debates between the kind of two outsiders that have no links whatsoever to Canada. In terms of like you know rumors of of potter or marsh but we did kind of mention um it a little bit tommy and bobby and it's a tough question for you alex so before we move on to the our last segment here in the stream out of the two of cpl's finest uh is there one that jumps out to you that you would rather see and i'm just talking about taking over as head coach like you know they, they trust him whatever happens to be yellow like they, you know he moves on they give the reins to one of these two is there one over their time in the CPL that you think has done a little bit more? Maybe it's an easy question because of, you know, Bobby's uh, trophy hall, but um, I know you're a big fan of Tommy too. So which one of those two would you go for? It's incredibly harsh to one of them, no matter I know, what I'm sorry. I I'm pick, sorry. Right? It's just like, um, yeah, you, you're going either way. You, you can make a good argument for both. I guess it would probably just be, <laughs> yeah, why not both? Look, funnily enough, like, just to throw this idea out there, because, you know, last year I thought it was a very interesting quote, Jim Curtin of the Philadelphia Union, very good coach. Those union teams always overperform their budget, gone on some good runs to MLS Cups, Porter Shields, etc. Jim Curtin was asked, would you ever coach the U.S. men's national team? Because it was when Verhalter was in that limbo stays. And Curtin said something interesting. He's like, look, if we're serious about soccer in this country, any top American coach should be willing to take the job. And if... He said it like if I was hired as an assistant, yeah, maybe it's not as nice of a job as he has there in Philadelphia as a head coach. He would take it because he thinks that's the mindset you need or everyone should be on board willing to help the U.S. team. Maybe there's a scenario where you end up getting both on a staff, right? Like a Tommy Wilden Jr. and a Bobby Spear notice where they bring their different strengths to the table, uh, you know, man management, tactics, you know, all those things, famili familiarity, because of course, Wilden Jr.'s coached a couple of the, the more, the Alberta guys, right? So he's familiar with an Atacubi. Then he coached a, a Latour if he ends up making the wit in the mix. Waterman, Sator, uh, you know, a bunch of those guys. Meanwhile, Bobby, of course, familiar with a lot of the Hamilton guys, like a, the Sigma guys, like a Buchanan, a Larea, Laren, et cetera, like that. Who knows? Maybe there's a scenario where both come into play. 
But I think if I'm going to have to pick one, just to put me on the spot, I'll go Smirnotis <laughs> just because yeah. I think of the names you mentioned. Buchanan, Larea, Laren, those are guys who are all key parts of this national team. And I think that familiarity would be would be would allow him to immediately have trust of some of the top players. I think tactically, a lot of the things he's done where if with Forge, they're so flexible. They sometimes play 4-3-3s, four, 4-2-3-1s, three, three, four, three, 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 four, three, three box threes. You know, Achenard Janssen playing as a, in the John Stones role. Tristan Borges is playing free roles. Like he's he's done a lot of flexible tactical things. So tactically, no doubt in my mind, he's got that. And he's got a lot of CONCACAF experience. And that's just the one edge on the resume, at least, that he has over Tommy Wilden Jr. is that Screen Otis has been in CONCACAF for five different seasons. He's done two Champions Cup slash Champions League runs. He's done three CONCACAF League runs. He's been in CONCACAF. He knows that side of it. Um, so I think there's something where uh, Smirnotis ticks a lot of those boxes that I'd want tactically. And for what it's worth, the hardest thing that any manager in the world will tell you, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, any league where you're clearly the best team, it's hard to win every year. And especially in a league where it's, it's, a, it's the Canadian Premier League is a salary capped league. You know how if you think about how ridiculous it is to win four out of five titles, even if there's only eight teams. That's a very impressive achievement because you can easily, easily lose a locker room along the way. Players get frustrated at you. The fact he's done it, he's kept guys like Becker, uh, you know, Borges, of course, left but came back. Uh, you know, Chuan Yer, Samuel, Achinodi Janssen, all these core guys have stuck around. They keep on winning. That's impressive locker room management. So I think uh, something like Spinotis ticks a lot of boxes I'd want to see. I won't pick up much of that because you you know you, you checked almost every box but I, I will say i agree like i would i would go with bobby uh, four or five is hard to argue with but i think the important thing is is that he hasn't always won the regular season uh, but when it comes to being clutch and guess what international football is about knockout tournaments bobby has been lights out um that's just the way his forge sides have been it's kind of like a running theme is that they won't win the league throughout the season but come playoffs he knows how to get the job done and i think that's pretty important and i think that's unfortunately for tommy right now it's because tommy and the Cavs have won the most cpl regular seasons and when they get to the playoffs they they fall in flat so so it's something it's, it's it's something small um you can i guess i just think for international football you could argue that having the ability to do it when it matters the most in playoffs would maybe give you a little, little bit of the edge but alex moving on to our final topic now of the day and that is just going to be a big picture look right now because right right at this moment canada has some of the best matchups i'm assuming ever i, I don't know i don't know if, if what the history books say if there's been this run of matches where you go netherlands france argentina it's incredible so i just want to take a little look of how we got there um do you think the world cup had any impact of maybe lining these friendlies up um and and for the big picture of the game like I think this is a huge summer to hopefully capture even more eyes going to a beautiful tournament that I'm so excited to see. I hope we do well, but I think it's more important that Canadians should be treated this summer to being able to see their national team go up against the very best of the best. And it's a very good, very good place to be. So how did we get here, Alex? How, what, how did we line up these, these two matches after going so long without super quality matches? Yeah, it's, I think hopefully I, I'd probably say this is the World Cup effect coming into play. I think there's been a newfound respect about Canada. And of course, you know, we forget that, that despite a lot of that has gone on over the last year, like, you know, all, everything off the field, protests, disputes, dips in form outside of Canada. A lot of that hasn't really been picked up by the rest of the world. I think for the rest of the world, they just saw Canada have a great story to make the 22 World Cup. Impressed with their, you know, their bravery at the World Cup. You know, some call it naivety, some call it bravery. Take your pick. You can go either way. And now teams like, okay, this Canadian um, side is fearless without respect. And I, I just noticed it because I, I found it very interesting the other day. We're watching Aston Villa. Lille, you know, Aston Villa is a pretty darn good team. They got a World Cup winning goalkeeper, uh, some other very interesting players across. Ollie Watkins, probably like one of the most informed forwards in the world right now. And, you know, the broadcast, which I'm pretty sure is the world feed. I know because it's Fubo, it's Canada. You could argue it's Canada. It's the world feed. They spent a good five minutes talking about Jonathan David, Canada making the Copa America. 
J David potentially leading the line at Copa America. They're talking about Canada's formation, like what they were playing. I was like, what is this sort of discussion? But it's like, oh, there's like this respect around the world that, okay, like these Canadian players, they played an interesting level. All that, so I think that that's what we kind of forget. And I think now that obviously the Canada's found out a way to make these friendlies work, because as we always know and forget, friendlies are tough because financially there's this load of trying to get a venue. Usually teams require some sort of appearance fee to come over, et cetera. It's not easy to book them. Clearly they found a formula that works with doing these on the road. Maybe that means they eat a bit of a, uh, they, they eat a little bit, lit, a bit less revenue, et cetera. But teams, I think, respect Canada. I think this is a sign that in the right circumstances, they're willing to give this Canadian team a shot. And now they have to make the most of these and, and continue to hopefully book more. No, I'm just looking at the, the comment here from from Talia. But no, I, I I agree. No, um, I, I agree with everything you said, Alex, and I agree with this this comment as well. Because I too full of parade, but getting these uh, friendlies is a shock. It, it is a bit of a shock. I I was super impressed when we lined up the Netherlands friendly because in recent time we haven't even been able to fill our international windows. We've been we we obviously missed the one, and then I think the following one we had the opportunity to have two. And we only had one and then even at this uh this qualifier where we beat tnt there was an opportunity to have another friendly and uh, other other nations did as well so it just kind of seemed like canada was falling apart and it didn't look like it was going to turn around and all of a sudden they just start you, and again i don't know what i'm not behind the scenes i don't know exactly if it's all kevin blue i don't know where it's all coming from but the fact that they went from basically being frustrated and then and i, I put a tweet out of this and i don't have it off the top of my head i'm sorry if it's a little off but i believe during the world cup qualifying run that year we had like 22 canada matches like the men's national team matches and then the following year with the world cup i believe we had close to 20 maybe like 19 and then the following year i think it dipped down to like 11 2023 had basically half the amount of matches we were used to and like i said not filling up your international slots is a part of that um and it just it's a shame and now all of a sudden it looks like 2024 could really turn around getting two quality friends i don't know if you could ask for any better friendlies um I, I saw a couple comments earlier being like maybe a france and like a greece would have been a little bit better so you get like you know the top tier but i'm like i'm not gonna argue if you're gonna line up a friendly of the netherlands and france and this type in this type of preparation for a an, an argentina that you know you have i'll take it every day of the week i don't care if we get smacked three nothing as long as this canadian side can learn something from both of those matches going into the tournament it's a massive win for me um i'm not the most confident personally about how Canada will do at this tournament, just because I don't know exactly what the team is going to look like going into it with the manager and whatnot. But regardless of how, how it happens, like ideally, I think we get a new manager in and then, you know, hopefully it, it's, it's a big learning experience. If it's yellow and we get, we get stomped around. I still think it's a fantastic experience for these players to play these friendlies, no matter what I just, I think it is. So with that final thought, Alex, uh, we have a little promo to uh, to show. I'm going to let you talk a little bit about your new show. Um, I don't speak French. I will not be a part of this show with, with my with my guy here. I'll still have him on the English side of things. But there is a new French show. Um, every episode is going to drop on Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So, Alex, you want to just give a quick little overview of the show itself, uh, your guys' first episode, which I believe has been recorded. And then I will share the promo once you are done talking. Yeah, for sure. For those interested in some one soccer uh, content on Francais, make sure to tune into Le Bouclier Canadien this Thursday. For now, it's uh, bi-weekly, so every two weeks for for now. It's a bit of a pilot. So if you are, you know, if you Francophone, if you have any Francophone friends, um, you know, if you want to work on your French, you know, maybe you're already doing Duolingo, you have a trip to France planned in the next year or two, it's a good chance for you to practice. We'll be talking about all things Canadian soccer, myself, Sofiane Benzenza, and Milton George. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a Canadian soccer show. It's not just Montreal specific. It's not just, you know, Quebec specific. It's all Canadian soccer viewpoints from a fran francophone perspective, of course. And it's exciting. This first week, we brought Olivier Renard on, the sporting director of CF Montreal. He was a fantastic interview. Of course, he talked about Montreal, but he talked about his thoughts on the CPL, the, the Canadian national team. And then, of course, we had some other discussions off the bat. So, hey, if you enjoy it, make sure to tune in because we would love to do more French stuff in the future. But we're going to need the support to be excellent in those first episodes to show there is a reason why we want to do this. The French market is very important. 
one that we want to see continue to grow and feel involved in this, especially myself as someone who's bilingual and speaks English, but also been on the French side. I think it would be great to have more French, you know, content available. So excited for this first episode. Make sure to tune in for our chat with Olivier Renard and, of course, our other chat, which includes a nice little men's national team manager uh, debate that was quite, quite interesting. Tune in on Thursday. I like it. I like it. I wish I could speak more than just English. I'm one of the, the unfortunate ones. Alex is very impressive. I think he's, can you speak three, three languages? Uh, I, I can, I, two is fluent. Two is Spanish, fluent. Spanish is I, I can, I watch the games on FUBU in, in, in Spanish sometimes and I understand and I can hold a conversation in Spanish. I just probably wouldn't be comfortable enough to have a TV show. Okay, well, it's more, it's more than I, I can, but yeah, hopefully if you guys are excited for that, like I, like Alex said and myself said, Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern time, get a, um, get ready, um, and we're going to have a little promo for it right now, so enjoy. that doesn't get you fired up i don't know what will <laughs> so hopefully that was that was good that was good 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 work there from our one soccer team putting that together that is all the time though we have for the stream today i really hope you guys enjoyed it i hope that if any of you um french listeners are excited for alex's new show of course and as always uh if you guys could be so kind be sure to drop a like on your way out drop a sub if you're new around here and we will see you guys soon cheers friends <laughs>